Monday, 27th of December, 1943. Dear Kitty, On Friday evening, for the first time in my life, I received something for Christmas. Kufis and Crawler and the girls had prepared a lovely surprise again. Meep has made a lovely Christmas cake, on which was written, Peace, 1944. Eli had provided a pound of sweet biscuits of pre-war quality. For Peter, Margo and me, a bottle of yogurt and a bottle of beer for each of the grown-ups. Everything was so nicely done up, and there were pictures stuck on different packages. Otherwise, Christmas passed by quickly for us. Yours, Anne. Wednesday, 29th of December, 1943. Dear Kitty, I was very unhappy again last evening. Granny and Lies came into my mind. Granny, oh darling Granny, how little we understood of what she suffered or how sweet she was. And besides all this, she knew a terrible secret which she carefully kept to herself the whole time. How faithful and good Granny always was. She would never have let one of us down. Whatever it was, however naughty I had been, Granny always stuck up for me. Granny, did you love me? Or didn't you understand me either? I don't know. No one ever talked about themselves to Granny. How lonely Granny must have been. How lonely in spite of us. A person can be lonely even if he is loved by many people, because he is still not the one and only to anyone. And lies. Is she still alive? What is she doing? Oh, God, protect her and bring her back to us. Lies. I see you in all the time what my lot might have been. I keep seeing myself in your place. Why then should I often be unhappy over what happens here? Shouldn't I be glad, contented, and happy, except when I think about her and her companions in distress? I am selfish and cowardly. Why do I always dream and think of the most terrible things? My fear makes me want to scream out loud sometimes. Because still, in spite of everything, I have not enough faith in God. He has given me so much, which I certainly do not deserve. And I still do so much that is wrong every day. If you think, you, if you think of your fellow creatures, then you only want to cry. You could really cry the whole day long. The only thing to do is pray that God will perform a miracle and save some of them. And I hope that I am doing that enough. Yours, Anne. Sunday, 2nd of January, 1944. Dear Kitty, this morning, when I had nothing to do, I turned over some of the pages of my diary, and several times I came across letters dealing with the subject mummy in such a hot-headed way that I was quite shocked and asked myself, Anne, is it really you who mentioned hate? Oh, Anne, how could you? I remained sitting with the open page in my hand and thought about it and how it came about that I should have been so brimful of rage and really so filled with such a thing as hate that I had to confide it all in you. I have been trying to understand the Anne of a year ago and to excuse her because my conscience isn't clear as long as I leave you with these accusations without being able to explain, on looking back, how it happened. I suffer now, and suffered then, from moods which kept my head under water so to speak, and only allowed me to see the things subjectively without enabling me to consider quietly the words of the other side and to answer them as the words of one whom I, with my hot-headed temperament, had offended or made unhappy. I hid myself within myself. I only considered myself and quietly wrote down all my joys, sorrows, and contempt in my diary. This diary is of great value to me because it has become a book of memoirs in many places. But on a good many pages, I could certainly put past and done with. I used to be furious with Mummy, and still, and still am sometimes. It's true that she doesn't understand me, but I don't understand her either. She did love me very much, and she was tender. But as she landed in so many unpleasant situations through me, and was nervous and irritable because of other worries and difficulties, it is certainly understandable that she snapped at me. I took it much too seriously, was offended, and was rude and aggravating to Mummy, which, in turn, made her unhappy. 
so it was really a matter of unpleasantness and misery rebounding all the time. It wasn't nice for either of us, but it is passing. I just didn't want to see all this, and pitied myself very much. But that, too, is understandable. Those violent outbursts on paper were only giving vent to anger, which in a normal life could have been worked off by stamping my feet a couple times in a locked room or calling Mummy names behind her back. The period when I caused Mummy to shred to shed tears is over. I have grown wiser, and Mummy's nerves are not so much on edge. I usually keep my mouth shut if I get annoyed, and so does she, so we appear to get on much better together. I can't really love Mummy in a dependent childlike way. I just don't have that feeling. I soothe my conscience now with the thought that it is better for hard words to be on paper than that Mummy should carry them in her heart. Yours, Anne. Wednesday, 5th of January, 1944. Dear Kitty, I have two things to confess to you today, which will take a long time. But I must tell someone, and you are the best one to tell, as I know that, come what may, you always keep a secret. The first is about Mummy. You know that I've grumbled a lot about Mummy, yet still try to be nice to her again. Now it is suddenly clear to me that she lacks. Mummy herself has told us that she looked upon us more as her friends than her daughters. Now, that is all very fine, but still, a friend can't take a mother's place. I need my mother as an example which I can follow. I want to be able to respect her. I have the feeling that Margot thinks differently about these things and would never be able to understand what I've just told you, and Daddy avoids all arguments about Mummy. I imagine a mother as a woman who in the first place, shows great tact, especially towards her children when they reach our age, and who does not laugh at me if I cry about something, not pain, but other things, like mums does. One thing, which perhaps may seem rather fatuous, I have never forgiven her. It was on a day that I had to go to the dentist. Mummy and Margot were going to come with me, and agreed that I should take my bicycle. When we had finished at the dentist and were outside again, Margot and Mummy told me that they were going into the, into the town to look at something or buy something. I don't remember exactly what. I wanted to go too, but was not allowed to, as I had my bicycle with me. Tears of rage sprang into my eyes, and Mummy and Margot began laughing at me. Then I became so furious that I stuck my tongue out at them in the street just as an old woman happened to pass by who looked very shocked. I rode home on my bicycle, and I know I cried for a long time. It is queer that the wound that Mummy made then still burns, when I think of how angry I was that afternoon. The second is something that is very difficult to tell you, because it is about myself. Yesterday, I read an article about blushing by Sis Heister. This article might have been addressed to me personally, Although I don't blush very easily, the other things in it certainly all fit me. She writes roughly something like this, that a girl in the years of puberty becomes quiet within and begins to think about the wonders that are happening to her body. I experienced that too, and that is why I get the feeling lately of being embarrassed about Margot, Mummy, and Daddy. Funnily enough, Margot, who is much more shy than I am, isn't at all embarrassed. I think what is happening to me is so wonderful, and not only what can be seen on my body, but all that is taking place inside. I never discuss myself or any of these things with anybody. That is why I have to talk to myself about them. Each time I have a period, and that has only been three times, I have the feeling that in spite of all the pain, unpleasantness, and nastiness, I have a sweet secret, and that is why although it is nothing but a nuisance to me in a way, I always long for the time that I shall feel that secret within me again. Sis Heister also writes that girls of this age don't feel quite certain of themselves and discover that they themselves are individuals with ideas, thoughts, and habits. After I came here, when I was just 14, I began to think about myself sooner than most girls and to know that I am a person. Sometimes, when I lie in bed at night, 
I have a terrible desire to feel my breasts and to listen to the quiet rhythmic beat of my heart. I already had these kinds of feelings subconsciously before I came here, because I remember that once, when I slept with a girlfriend, I had a strong desire to kiss her, and that I did do so. I could not help being terribly inquisitive over her body, for she had always kept it hidden from me. I asked her whether, as of proof of our friendship, we should feel one another's breasts, but she refused. I go into ecstasies every time I see the naked figure of a woman, such as Venus, for example. It strikes me as so wonderful and exquisite that I have difficulty in stopping the tears rolling down my cheeks. If only I had a girlfriend. Yours. Anne.